All right, good morning, everybody. We've got 9.30. So we're going to finish up what we didn't get to last time in Chapter 5, and then we're going to start Chapter 6. Before we do that, though, I do want to make a couple of comments. Number one, you should be getting your um, exam redos back in lab. Uh, I've given those to uh, Miss Autumn, so if, uh, if you don't have it, go, go talk to her. I, I turned everything over to her. Also, uh, the last quiz, there was one person that didn't put their name on, on their quiz, uh, and so there's a note on there. Uh, please come see me when you get it back, and I'll give you your credit. So. If you turned it in and you have a zero listed in, in Canvas for, for the last quiz, it's probably you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just when you get that quiz back, please bring it to me uh, or email me uh, a picture of it because I don't remember exactly what the grade was uh, and, and just say it's me uh, and, and give me your name and all that stuff and I'll, I'll give you your credit. So uh, I know at the end of class sometimes you just rip things out and forget. Uh, so I'm not going to penalize anybody for that, but please try in the future to remember to, I can't give you credit if I don't know who you are, so uh, appreciate that. The other thing I want to talk real briefly about is the weather. It feels nice outside, it's spring's come early, and uh, everybody wants to be outside, get some sunshine and all that good stuff, and that's a good thing uh, for all of us as it starts to stay lighter longer, but don't forget your studies. So it's easy in the spring to have a little spring fever, being cooped up in the winter with all the um, rain and cold weather and all that. And so uh, it's easy to forget about your studies. But please don't. Um, again, you know, for every credit hour of class in, that you have, you need to be spending about, or contact hour, excuse me, that you have in class, you need to be spending about two hours a week outside of class, approximately. Uh, some classes a little more than others, it just depends on where you're at. So uh, if you're having any issues with that, feel free to come and, and talk with me. We can, we can talk about study strategies. Be happy to do that with you. So last time we started talking about um, alkenes and how we can add uh, hydrogen across the carbon-carbon double bond. And so we can take something like oleic acid, which is a uh, fatty acid. Uh, it's biologically relevant. Uh, and you can hydrogenate, that is add two hydrogens across the carbon-carbon double bond and get stearic acid. And I mentioned to you all that uh, if you allowed this to sit in the presence of hydrogen and you came back in about a million years, you still wouldn't see much that has happened. And so we determined last time that we needed a catalyst to do this, right? So we needed hydrogen, but we also needed a catalyst. Can anybody remember what the catalysts were? Yeah, nickel will work, nickel metal will work, palladium will work, and platinum will work. That's right. Now, there are others, but those are the ones that I'm holding you responsible for. Those are, um, with the exception of nickel, nickel's pretty cheap. But palladium and platinum are very precious metals. They're more expensive than gold. Gold, believe it or not, is actually a cheap metal. Chemists will actually use it in reactions and throw it away. It's that cheap, uh, relatively speaking. Silver's dirt cheap. Uh, but, I mean, compared to, compared to the cost that you have to pay for palladium and platinum. So, when you think about expensive metals, most people think about gold, but gold is by no means the most expensive metal out there. It's, it's, there's things more precious. And these actually have uses. I mean, gold pretty much so is useless, other than making jewelry. Uh, but palladium, platinum, and nickel, very useful industrially. You can make a lot of things with them. So we can take... Uh, an alkene, and we can convert it to what functional group? If we're going, from, we're going from an alkene to a what? To an alkane. That's right. So we can convert alkenes into alkanes. And we've already learned that we can convert alkenes into other functional groups. What were some of the other functional groups that we've learned that we can convert alkenes into? Alcohols. We just talked about alkanes. We can make dihalides, we can add halogen across the carbon-carbon double bond, we can make alkyl halides, we can add H, uh, HX, HI, HBr, HCl across the carbon-carbon double bond, and now we, of course, can add hydrogen across the carbon-carbon double bond. So what I hope you're seeing is that, in fact, the alkene functional group 
is a great thing to be able to start with because you can convert it into a variety of things that you either want or need for whatever purpose you have to do, okay? This is called catalytic reduction. Okay, this is a reduction reaction. We are taking something that has less hydrogen and we're going to something that has more hydrogen. You all learned in general chemistry about oxidation and reduction. Can anybody remember what oxidation was? What did you learn in gen chem? Anybody remember the acronym you might have learned? Leo Gurr, yeah, Leo the line goes Gurr. I like, I'm from Oklahoma, so it's an oil state. I like oil rig, uh, and I, that's the one I remember. So oil rig, oil, oxidation is loss. Rig, reduction is gain. What is the loss in the gain? What are you losing in oxidation? What are you gaining in reduction? Electrons. electrons, that's right. So an oxidation of something is taking electrons away from it. Reducing something is giving it electrons. And in organic chemistry, it's real easy to see when something is oxidized or reduced. You all had to calculate oxidation numbers in gen chem. Here, all you have to do is count the number of bonds to hydrogen. The more bonds a carbon has to hydrogen, the more reduced it is. The fewer bonds that it has to a hydrogen, the more oxidized it is. So this is a reduction. We're adding carbon-hydrogen bonds to the molecule, okay? Now, as you all might imagine, palladium and platinum and nickel are metals. And if you take a metal and you put it in something like water or you put it in something like alcohol, it's just metal in, in there. It doesn't dissolve. Okay? It's, it's just a fine powder that's in the liquid. And so these are what we call um, excuse me, heterogeneous reactions. Okay? So your alkene might be in solution. The hydrogen might dissolve into solution, but the metal does not. And so that means that the reaction has to occur on the surface of the metal. And it makes it very difficult to understand the mechanism. And people have been studying this for a long time. And what we believe is happening in this particular case is that the metal surface is that the hydrogen actually gets absorbed onto the metal. And we know that because we can take the metal and we can add hydrogen gas to it and the metal's mass will increase by the amount of hydrogen that it absorbs. Okay, so we know that metals will attract hydrogen to themselves. Okay, and so what we think happens is that the hydrogen, which is represented here by these little white spheres, forms these little uh, interactions with the metal surface. And what we also know is that the metal surface can react with the pi bond and break that pi bond. Okay. And so what you have is a, the alkene interacting with the metal surface and it breaks the pi bond, so you have these carbon metal bonds. And we know that the hydrogen does the same thing. And so these alkenes are on the surface and so are these hydrogen atoms. And what happens is, is that they eventually get close enough to where one of the hydrogens will attach itself to the carbon and break the carbon metal bond and the hydrogen metal metal bond and form a new carbon hydrogen bond. And that happens over and over again until you get an alkane. And now the alkane can no longer interact with the metal surface and it, and it leaves the metal surface. Okay? And so it's a fairly complicated way of thinking about chemistry because it's not all in solution. It's hard to, to measure. And so you have to have special equipment to figure it out. Okay? But this has consequences. Okay? This has consequences because if I imagine taking an alkene, so imagine that this table is the metal surface and there's hydrogen all on this metal surface. When the alkene comes down to interact with the metal surface, it does it only from one face of the alkene, right? Think about that. I can't get both the top face and the bottom face to interact at the same time with the metal surface. So only one, surf, or one face of the alkene, the bottom face as it is, will come down and interact with that metal surface. When that happens, the hydrogens are going to come in from the bottom. So what's going to happen to these two blue things if the hydrogen comes in from the bottom and then a hydrogen comes in from the bottom here? What's going to happen to these two blue things? They'll move. They'll move, and as this goes from an sp2 hybridized carbon to what? If it goes from an alkene to an alkene, it's going to go from sp2 hybridized to 
is P3 hybridized, right? And so these blue little things that I've got here will actually be pointing in the same direction. And that's what I'm trying to show you here in this example. So when the hydrogen adds, you're going to have those two methyl groups. How are they going to be with respect to one another? What would you say to somebody about that? Are they cis or are they trans? The two methyl groups, the two wedges coming out towards us. They are cis to one another. Yeah. Hydrogenations, catalytic hydrogenations always give cis alkenes or uh, cis additions to the alkene. Okay? And so you're going to end up with the cis addition, and you're only going to end up with that one molecule. The two methyl groups are going to be close to one another. And this is important. Okay? So um, if we look at the energy relationships that is going on, right? As we are reducing a carbon-carbon double bond, we are going to an alkane, right? Is that favorable or unfavorable? Favorable. Why? You're right. Why is it? Because the sigma, sigma bonds increases, right? Remember that the reaction will always lie to the side with the most sigma bonds, as we learned earlier. And so you can actually take these alkenes you can hydrogenate them and you can have a thermometer in there essentially and you can measure the amount of heat that's given off during that reaction. And that tells us something about how stable a molecule was to start with. The more heat that is giving off from a reaction, the more unstable the starting material was. Okay? And so we can figure out a lot of this stuff. You learned a little bit of this in Gen Chem, uh, but you didn't learn about it for hydrogenation, but it's the same thing. Do you remember doing the uh, calorimetry lab in Gen Chem. We had the coffee cups and you did the thermometer. It's the same thing. The only thing is that since we're working with hydrogen gas and all this, you can't use coffee cups. You have to use a special piece of equipment. But it's the same thing. You can figure out what the heat of the reaction is. And so what you're seeing here is if I take ethylene, CH2, CH2, that's the common name. Uh, we would call that ethene, right, uh, by the regular naming system. If I hydrogenate that, I get 137 uh, kilojoules uh, per mole of uh, heat that is released. Okay? And so as you look at that, you can see that not all of these alkenes are the same. So if you look at uh, the cis-2-butene, the trans-2-butene, what can you tell me there in those differences? Right, if I look at cis-2-butene, I get 120 kilocalories of, or excuse me, kilojoules of heat coming out per mole. If I do the trans butene, I only get 115 uh, kilojoules of heat coming out. Why is it different? Because the trans is more stable. Because the trans is more stable. That's exactly right. Right? These things are exactly the same except their structure. They have the same number of carbons, the same number of hydrogens, the same functional group. But I'm getting five kilojoules per mole less heat energy uh, out of this reaction when I react to trans. And that's because the trans is more stable. Okay? So the trans 2-butene being more stable gives us less heat when it gets uh, hydrogenated to the alkane. Now if I hydrogenate cis 2-butene and trans 2-butene, what's the product that I get from that reaction? If I take butene and I hydrogenate it, what would I get? Butane. butane. Butane, yeah. And I get but the same butane whether I hydrogenate either one of these. It's exactly the same molecule that I get, uh, but these have different uh, stabilities. And so now notice what happens when you add more methyl groups. So I have this molecule that has, so if I look at the alkene part only, right? I would say that I have three methyl groups attached to that alkene. And here I have four methyl groups attached to this alkene. What can you tell me about the difference here? It's decreasing. It is decreasing, so that must mean that this is what? More stable than this. So the more substituents you have on an alkene, we also know the more stable that they are. This is how we figured out stabilities of these molecules. 
You know, before I was just telling you the cis and the trans are, you know, one's more stable than the other, and I was using a model to show you how in the cis things are crowded and getting in the way, and trans, they're further apart, right? And you just kind of believe me. Uh, and that's okay, but here's the experimental evidence that's, that tells us that in fact that is correct. We actually were able to make a measurement of the stability by doing these hydrogenation reactions. Okay, and then there's the example of the transtubutene, the cis-tubutene. Again, those two methyl groups being close together cause a strain. They, they get in the way of each other, and so that makes it higher in energy, and so you get more heat out of that reaction uh, than you do with the trans isomer. Alkynes can also do the same type of chemistry. We can reduce alkynes. They're no different than alkenes other than we have an extra pi bond, right, between the same two carbons. So each one of these carbon atoms right here is what hybridization? SP. Those are SP hybridized carbon atoms. And we can reduce them. And you might imagine that there are two ways that it can be reduced, right? You could just add two equivalents of hydrogen. And let's just say we're using palladium as our catalyst. So we can go from an alkyne to a, what's the functional group for the bottom? We're going from an alkyne to a alkane, okay? And that's not hard to imagine, right? You've got two pi bonds. You're just going to add hydrogen to one pi bond, and then you're going to add hydrogen again to the other pi bond, right? But you, all, you might also expect that you could only add one equivalent of hydrogen and stop at the alkene, right? So if I only add one equivalent of hydrogen, I'm going to end up with an alkene, okay? What's the problem with that? The problem with that is the alkene will also react to make the alkane, right? We know that alkenes will react. However, there is a special catalyst called Linlar's catalyst that stops at the alkene. It cannot reduce it further to the alkane, okay? It's a poisoned catalyst that actually contains palladium, but it contains other things like lead and some other stuff, okay? It's called a poisoned catalyst. Uh, and it will stop at the alkene. Now, if I left it for 100 years, it would probably reduce it all the way to the alkene. But it's so much slower at reducing alkenes than it is alkynes. And so you can make uh, alkenes from alkynes, and you can make alkanes from alkynes. And so that should tell us that the alkyne functional group is kind of important. It allows us to do a lot of different kinds of chemistry, and in fact it is, okay? What kind of alkene are we getting in the reduction of uh, an alkyne with Linlar's catalyst? Is that cis or trans? Is that alkene cis or trans? It is cis. It is cis. So what you need to know is that the reduction with Linlar's catalyst of an alkyne to an alkene will always give you the cis alkene. It will always do that. It will always give you the cis alkene. Okay? And again, that's because we're talking about a metal surface. Okay, so here's an alkyne. As it approaches that metal surface, the two hydrogens are going to come in from the same face. And so that's going to push the two methyl groups, in this case, to the same side. And so you're going to end up with a cis alkene. I show you this example for a particular reason. I had a colleague when I was a postdoc at Vanderbilt, and her job was to make special alkenes because they were studying atherosclerosis. Do anybody know what that is? What's atherosclerosis? I think I pronounced it. Atherosclerosis. I always have trouble with medical terms. It's the hardening of your arteries, right? It's, it's built plaque buildup. Does anybody know where, where that comes from? It comes from fatty acids. We eat these fatty acids and over time, they start to clog up your arteries, right? Something that older people start to worry about. It is a natural process, but they were studying why this was happening. And so she had to make a whole series of model compounds for the study. 
And she made all of her model compounds by taking alkynes and reducing them to the alkenes using Lumlar's catalyst. Okay? And so uh, this actually has importance in medical research, this type of chemistry. It does get used. Uh, my former uh, postdoctoral advisor, Dr. Ned Porter, is credited with figuring out the mechanism for how heart disease basically works. Uh, and so, you know, we were doing all this chemistry on these types of things, but they did have medical uh, relevance or health relevance, if you will. So, very important kind of stuff to be talking about. So, what I want to point out to you right now is the importance of the alkyne. And we've learned, <coughs> let me just put a methyl group here, it doesn't matter. What have we learned about alkynes that have a hydrogen at the end? What do we know about that hydrogen? It's very acidic for a hydrocarbon, right? This hydrogen can be removed pretty easily by base. Does anybody remember what the pKa roughly was of that hydrogen? 14 is a little too low. 25? Around 25, yeah. So it has a pKa of around 25. Now that is no way, shape, or form what you would have talked about in general chemistry as being a strong acid. But remember, an alkane has a pKa of 50. All right, so it's 25 orders of magnitude more acidic than an alkane. And so we can react this with bases, <coughs> fairly strong bases, not sodium hydroxide. Okay, this one won't work. But we can use a molecule called sodium amide. Okay, this base has a pKa of around 35. So it has a pKa higher than the pKa of the hydrocarbon. So the reaction should go to the right. And so what happens in a mechanism is the base abstracts the proton. Those electrons go onto that carbon. Ammonia, of course, is a gas, so it bubbles out of the solution. And you end up with this salt. It's called an alkanide. Don't worry about that term too much. <laughs> but it's called an alkanide. Just like halogens are called halides, right? Like chloride, this is called an alkanide. Okay? IDE usually means a negatively charged something, right? This is carbon with a negative charge. This will react with other molecules, right? This will react with things like halides that we'll learn about in another chapter. So I could take something like this molecule. This is called iodomethane. And the alkanide will react with it. I want to put a star here so you can see where the new carbon is. What's important about that? Why should that amaze you? That simple reaction, why should that amaze you? Okay, so we can make carbon-carbon bonds, right? We can react with a variety of things and we can make carbon-carbon bonds. This, doing this, not just this, but doing this, making a carbon-carbon bond is the hardest thing to do in chemistry. There's only a handful of ways to do it. It's the challenge. Your body's really good at it. Your body takes the food you eat, it breaks it down, and it builds it back up into new things. It makes new carbon-carbon bonds. Doing that in a flask is challenging. More Nobel Prizes have been awarded for making the carbon-carbon bond in unique ways uh, than just about anything else. More so than for medicine and physiology. I mean, it's important. Okay? Because think about all the things that you use, the plastics that you use. You have to form new carbon-carbon bonds. 
Think about when you go to the doctor and you get a medicine. They had to take crude oil and convert that crude oil into medicine. They had to make take what carbon-carbon bonds was in the crude oil and move it around and make new carbon-carbon bonds to make the medicine. Okay? And this is one way to do that, is to take something like an alkanine and react it with an alkyl halide. And you can make a new carbon-carbon bond. And that's very, very important. It's very, very powerful to be able to do that. Okay? Uh, we know how to do a lot of chemistry. We know how to convert a lot of functional groups into other functional groups. But there's a limited number of ways in which we can take two things and put their carbons together. Okay? And so, and that's kind of the important thing of the whole, whole shabam. So to speak. All right, we're going to jump into chapter six now. If I can get this turned on. And today we're going to start talking about stereoisomers, and we've already kind of started talking about it. We've talked about cis and trans already, so you already know a little bit about stereoisomers. Okay, stereoisomers are nothing more than how atoms are connected in three dimensions. Okay, but today we're going to start talking about a very special type of stereoisomer. Okay, and it has to do with this concept of chirality. Okay, so C-H-I-R I-R-A-L-I-T-Y is not pronounced chirality, it's chirality, okay? okay? It's not chiral, it's chiral, okay? Uh, people, rightly so, get kind of confused with that, okay? And we're going to talk about the idea of a stereogenic center, okay? So I asked you all to bring your model kits. I need you all to get out one carbon atom and four, four different colored spheres, so you should have blue, green, red, and white. So get one carbon atom and four colored spheres, separate, you know, red, white, blue, and green. Put your, put your carbon together. You've got a carbon, okay? And now on your four colored spheres, I don't want you looking at what your neighbor's grabbing, I don't want you to look at me. Randomly pick a color and randomly put it on one of the spots on your carbon atom. Just at random. Whatever comes up first, just pop it on. Any old way. No right way or wrong way to do this. Four different colors attached. And we're doing an experiment, so I need you all to do it. Did we make the same thing? Probably not, you're probably guessing right. But but didn't we? Right? We took one carbon atom and we put the same four colors on there, right? If I had to name this, I would name this, let's see. Uh, blue, green, red, white, methane. I have to do it all in alphabetical order, so I think. Okay. We all have one carbon atom with four different colors attached to it, right? But did we really make the same thing? If I made the same thing, right, I should be able to take my model and it should overlay perfectly with every one of your models, right? If we all made the same thing, that should be it. Atom for atom, colored ball for colored ball, it all should match up, right? So let's do that experiment. Let me see yours. So now I'm going to try to line everything up, and in fact she and I did make the same thing. Here's my model, here's her model. Notice everything lines up. So let's keep track. That's one, that's a light. That's two that's a light. Oh, look there. 
what's different. I can get the carbon to line up right, and let's not worry about the length. But I can get the carbon to line up right. I can get the blue spheres to line up. I can get the white spheres to line up. But notice her green is going where my red is, and my and her red is going where my green is. So is this the same? No. So we got two that's the same, one that's different. So it's two to one. Again, I can get the whites to match up, I can get the carbons to match up, I can get the greens, but I can't get the reds and blues, right? You made something different than me. That's two the same, two different. And in fact, if I went through, if we all truly did this at random, I would end up with a 50-50 mixture of people that made it just like me and people that made it just opposite of me. We call that a racemic mixture. Racemic mixture is a mixture of compounds that are same and different, if you will. Okay, we'll learn what that same and different stuff is. So hers and I and mine were the same. Would you agree? Let's see if I can get this to line up right. Notice what I can't do. Right? I can't get a mirror image, can I? If I think that this is the mirror. So if I'm holding this up in the mirror, hers, hers isn't a mirror image of mine. The mirror, there is no mirror. Right? Now if I take hers, yours would be the same. But if I take yours, notice when I hold these up, here's the mirror plane. This is me holding this up in my bathroom mirror, and this is the reflection. These are mirror images of one another. They're mirror images, but they are not superimposable. I can't take hers and superimpose it on mine. These are called enantiomers. They are chiral. Okay? They are chiral. So what do we know? We know that if I have one carbon atom with four different things attached to it, I should be able to generate a pair of enantiomers. One enantiomer that would look just like mine, one enantiomer that would look just like hers, and if nature did this at random, we would end up with a 50-50 mix that we'd call a, what did we call that mixture? Racemic. Racemic mixture, right? Now let's do one more thing to keep the model. Let me get to, we'll come back to this in just, where, where's it at? Surely. Oh, I must have missed it. Anyway, take, uh, let's take the white sphere off and replace it with a blue sphere. Does everybody take the white sphere off and replace it with a blue sphere? We could have picked any other sphere and just pick it on blue. What do you think the outcome of this experiment will be? Let's predict. This is science, right? We're going to do the experiment. What do you all predict will happen? It's okay if you're wrong. Will it be the same as the other experiment where we had a 50-50 mix? Or will it not? You think they'll all be the same? Well, we can test that, can't we? So let's test it. So. Oh, wait a second. That's a mirror image, isn't it? There's, there's the mirror image. Just a second ago, I told you that mirror images were not superimposable, right? But watch these. These are perfectly superimposable. So it's exactly the same thing. So just because you have a mirror image is not enough. It has to be a non-superimposable mirror image to be an enantiomer. So these are, in fact, identical molecules. It is a mirror image, but it's the same. And what about yours? Right? We would have predicted, since you built the same molecule before, that this would be exactly the same, right? And in fact, uh, it is. Right? And but we, we were different before, right? But now notice, once again, we're mirror images and we are superimposable. 
So what does this tell us? Are these enantiomers? These are exactly the same molecule, right? These are exactly the same molecule. They are not chiral. You have to have four different groups on a single carbon atom to make a chiral molecule. There's a little bit of a caveat to that that we're not going to go into in this class. There are other types of chiral things that don't have single carbon atoms with four different things on them. And you all are familiar with some of them. You all are already familiar with chirality. What on your person right now is chiral? Our hands. And in fact, that's what chirality means, it, the Greek word for handedness. If I take my left hand and I hold it up to a mirror in the morning, what do I get reflecting back at me? My right hand. If I take my right hand and I hold it up to a mirror, what do I get? I get my left hand as a reflection. These are mirror images. Are they superimposable? They are not. I can't superimpose one on the other. It's a very powerful concept. You all are born with chirality in front of you the whole time, but you never really think about it. Until you go to pick up a glove. Why does it matter? You ever tried to stick your hand, your right hand into a left-handed glo left glove? How, do, how well does that work out for you? No. Not very well. Like a baseball glove. I'm not talking about the cheap things that we give you in the lab. To, you know, but, but, but true, like baseball gloves. You can't put your right hand into a left-handed glove. You can't put your left hand into a right-handed glove. This is important. The molecules in your body are chiral. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them are. And it turns out that it's important because some drugs are also chiral. And you want that drug to be able to get into that enzyme, for example, to shut it down so that it'll lower your fever or fix whatever is ailing you. If it's not the right shape, it ain't gonna go in. And if it ain't gonna go in, it ain't gonna work. Okay, and that's very, very important. I told you on the very first day of class that structure is the most important thing in chemistry, especially for biology, right? This is part of that. And in fact, some handed drugs turn out to be toxic. Some of them turn out to be very helpful for us. And so it's very important to be able to make one and only one version of the molecule. If we did it by random, we'll end up with a 50-50 mix. Well, I don't want to take something that's 50% poison, right? Nobody does. And so, very, very important concept to grasp uh, through this simple little exercise. Now, we've already learned a little bit about isomers. We've learned about constitutional isomers, right? We've learned about the fact that, uh, for example, uh, these two molecules have exactly the same molecular formula, same number of carbon, same number of hydrogen, same number of oxygens, but they're different. They have different connectivities. That's what constitutional means. Okay, the connectivity of the atoms are different. And in fact, here, the functional groups are different. What's this functional group? That's an alcohol. What's this functional group? I haven't talked a whole lot about it, but it's called an ether. Okay, so this alcohol and this ether are in fact isomers of one another. They have the same number of carbon, same number of hydrogens, but they have different functional groups. Okay? They are not stereoisomers. They don't have the same connectivity. Stereoisomers have the same connectivity. Okay? But there are two flavors of stereoisomers. There are so-called diastereomers and enantiomers. And we've already learned about enantiomers. That's what we were doing when we had these molecules. These are enantiomers. Okay? And you've got the left-handed one. Whoops, excuse me. You've got the left-handed one here and the right-handed one there. Okay? But don't they look the same? Right? On carbon number two in both of them is attached an OH group. Right? different than up there in the constitutional isomer uh, category. Okay? These are mirror images of one another that are not superimposable. 
Why do we call these diastereomers? Because there's two different trees arranged in the orientations. There are two different orientations. Are they mirror images of one another? Is cis a mirror image of trans? It is not. Very good. But the connectivity is exactly the same. Right? It's a six membered ring. So it's a cyclo hex ane. And it's got two methyl groups on carbons number one and two. Right? And I would name this one as cis 1 2 dimethyl cyclohexane. And I would name this one as what? Trans 1 2 dimethyl cyclohexane. What do you think about the physical properties of these two molecules? Are they going to be the same, different? Shaking your head. They're not going to be the same. Cis, uh, the cis uh, diastereomer will have a different boiling point, will have a different melting point than the trans. What about the enantiomers? Do you think they'll have the same or different <coughs> physical properties? Turns out they have exactly the same physical properties. The left-handed molecule and the right-handed molecule will share the exact same melting point, the exact same boiling point. They're hard to distinguish by any experiment that we can do, except one. And we'll talk about what that one is uh, on our next class meeting on Thursday, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, there is a way that we can distinguish an antivirus experimentally, but it's not as straightforward as taking a melting point or a boiling point or something like that. Okay? You also are very aware of this idea of stereoisomers and them being important. Cellulose and starch are exactly the same thing in terms of number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. But they are stereoisomers of one another. What's different? Both of them have sugars. You know, when you, somebody says, oh, I'm on a low sugar diet, I'm eating salad, you're eating sugar. Okay? You're just eating sugar that you can't digest. Your body doesn't know how to digest it. Okay? That's cellulose. What do you know about starch? Yeah, potatoes, rice, right? We think about starchy vegetables, that kind of stuff. <coughs> can we get, can we digest starch? Yeah, we can get energy from starch, right? We eat it. It gives us our, it gives me anyway, uh, a big belly, right? But um, starch and cellulose are just linkages of these sugars. But the difference is, in cellulose, this oxygen is connecting the two sugars together. Notice that it's an equatorial equatorial bond, whereas in starch, it's axial equatorial. That little change makes all the difference in the world. Do you all worry about taking your cotton shirt and putting it in the washer? You're afraid it's just going to dissolve away? No, but cotton is nothing more than cellulose, right? Would you take a shirt made of starch and put it in the washer? What would happen to it? It would dissolve, right? That little change changed the physical properties drastically. Cellulose, salad, you can eat it. You don't get a whole lot out of it other than, you know, minerals and such. Uh, it's kind of filler, but you need the roughage, you know, to keep good, good clean health, uh, especially gut health. Starch, very different thing, but it's the same sugar, just connected differently. Again, structure is important to function. So, if you look at a large uh, polymer of, of cellulose, what you find is that cellulose, because it has equatorial-equatorial bonds, kind of makes these flat sheets. Okay. Whereas starch, because it has an axial equatorial bond, forms a helix. And that helix allows it to be soluble in water. The flat sheet is not soluble in water. That simple change of an equatorial bond to an axial bond made all the difference in the world, right? Made all the difference in the world. Right, and so we can think about uh, cellulose. Well, I hate it that my pointer doesn't work, right? So here's cellulose, and I know it's cellulose because this bond is equatorial-equatorial, right? And you think about all your cotton fabrics, it comes from the cotton plant. 
right? The cotton farmer doesn't worry about it raining and dissolving all of his cotton and washing it down the, down the ditch. Don't worry about that at all. In fact, he hopes for rain. He needs rain for it to grow, right? Uh, of course, wheat is, where it is very starchy, right? We use it to make bread. This is what uh, starch looks like, okay? This is, is in fact called amylose. It's a, it's a form of starch. Uh, we won't get into that too much. But if I take amylose and I take cellulose and I completely break them down, chop them up into their individual repeat units, their polymer repeat units, I get exactly the same thing. I get glucose. I get the energy deriving biomolecule that, you know, when you eat sugar. I get glucose, right? They're both made of the same, they're both made of the same thing, but they're connected differently. Again, connection makes a big difference. I hope you all can kind of see my passion about this. This is what I do my research on, is chirality. How you can make one enantiomer over the other has always been kind of exciting to me, okay? So, let's talk a little bit more about these. Again, constitutional isomers, they will have different names. Uh, they will have different physical properties. They will have different chemical properties. Alcohols react differently than ethers. Okay? They're, those are constitutional isomers, or can be constitutional isomers. Okay? Constitutional isomers can have different names. Butanol, diethyl ether. Very different names, even though the same number of carbon, same number of hydrogen, same number of oxygen. Stereoisomers, however, only differ in how the atoms are oriented in space. They're connected the same, but they're oriented differently in space. So they will have identical names except for their prefixes like cis or trans. Right? We can have 2-butene, but it can be cis-2-butene or it can be trans-2-butene. Right? Those have the same IUPAC names except for cis and trans. And they always, stereoisomers, must always have the same functional group. So on an exam, if I asked you which of the following are enantiomers, and you look at them and you go, wait a second, that one has a different functional group than everything else. It can't be. Right? Stereoisomers must have the same functional group. Okay? And a particular three-dimensional arrangement is called a configuration. My molecule, my enantiomer, and her enantiomer, if she still had it built, would be different configurations. One is left-handed, one is right-handed. Okay? So imagine trying to say that to somebody. I want the left-handed molecule, and I want the right-handed molecule. And you're sitting there going, how in the world do I figure out if it's really left-handed or right-handed? We have a method for that. Okay? We have a, a systematic method for naming an antimus. Okay? We'll talk a little bit about that. All right, take, uh, take about three minutes get your groups, and classify each of these pairs, the green, the blue, and the yellow, as either constitutional isomers or stereoisomers. Tell me whether each pair is a pair of constitutional isomers or stereoisomers.
What do y'all think about the green pair? They are constitutional isomers, and how do you know that? Now, enantiomers will have different configurations. Stereoisomers will have different configurations. Constitutional isomers don't have different configurations. What do they have? They have something that's different. What is it? Huh? The name is different. They have the same function. They do have the same function group here. They're all both alkanes. They do have different names. But the connectivity is different, right? And that's why they end up with different names. What's the parent in the one on the left? Pentane. What are the substituents? Yeah, so this is 2, 3, dimethyl, pentane, right? What's the, what's the longest chain here? Yeah, it's still a pentane, right? But what are, what are the 2, 4, dimethyl, pentane? In fact, so Gretchen was right. It is exactly the same parent. It's the same functional group. It's the same formula. But the connectivity is different. And we can see that by the name because of the numbers are different, right? This was 2, 3. This is 2, 4. Right? How about the blue pair? Constitutional? Why, why are those constitutional? They are different functional groups. Ah, this is an ether, right? An oxygen connected to two carbons. This is what? That's an alcohol, right? So those are constitutional isomers. How about the yellow pair? Those are stereoisomers, right? And here, the parent is cyclobutane. So it's one, two dimethyl cyclobutane in both cases, but one is cis and one is trans. Which one is trans? The one on the left and the one on the right is? Very good. Very good. You know, by the way, if you all ever like to play with Tinker Toys and Legos, you're going to love this chapter, right? Because it's about build, how we build things three-dimensional. And I loved that as a kid, right? And so uh, this is probably why this is my most favorite subject okay? in, in, in all of chemistry is this chirality stuff, okay? And we just learned, right, that a left hand and a right hand are mirror images of one another, and they're non-superimposable, right? So they are enantiomers. My right hand is an enantiomer of my left hand. Some of us are right-handed, some of us are left-handed, right? What other things might be chiral? What about socks? And we're talking about the socks that are like tube socks. We're not talking about the ones with the toe you put in, all right? Just regular old socks. When you pull your socks out of your drawer, do you worry about putting them on your right foot or your left foot? Nah, you just put them on, right? Uh, you may want the gold toes set up or whatever kind of socks you're wearing, but they're not chiral. They are mirror images of one another, but they're perfectly superimposable, right? When you do your laundry, you know you can lay the left sock or the right sock on top of each other, and they are perfectly superimposable. The, that is a, not, is a molecule that is not chiral, okay? And we just, oh, there it is. Too far. We just did the experiment right where we took and replaced and got two of the same color. We learned, right, that you have to have four different things attached to the carbon. Okay? Here are some things that you have to memorize. You got to know this, like definitions. You got to know these things. In general, a molecule with no stereogenic center will not be chiral. That is, if a molecule does not contain a carbon atom with four different things attached to it, chances are it's not going to be chiral. I told you earlier there's some caveats to that that we're not going to get into too much in this class. So for you all, if it has no stereogenic center, you're going to say it's, it, it, uh, if it doesn't have one, it won't be chiral. Okay? If you have a molecule with one stereogenic center, the molecule will always be chiral. It will have a non-superimposable mirror image. If you have one and only one stereogenic center in your molecule, it must be a chiral molecule. So that's the center of the group of That's the carbon atom. Yep. The stereogenic center. Yep, the carbon atom is what we call the center. Okay? 
the stereogenic center. If a molecule has two or more stereogenic centers, it may be chiral and it may not be. Life gets more complicated when you have more than one stereogenic center. Molecules that are not chiral are called achiral. Think of A as meaning the absence of, so achiral, molecules that are not chiral, contain a plane of symmetry, but chiral molecules do not. So, if I may borrow your model, we all agree that the two blue, one green, red methane was not chiral, right? Does it have a plane of symmetry? What do I mean by a plane of symmetry? If you look at it, if I hold it like this, you'll see there's a mirror plane that runs right down through here. This side is a mirror reflection of that side. A chiral molecule cannot have a plane of symmetry in it. Because anything that has a plane of symmetry and itself are superimposable. Do I have a plane of symmetry? I do. Where is it? Ignoring my blemishes, right? It's right down through me, right? There is a plane of symmetry that cuts me in half. I have chiral centers, but am I as a person chiral? No. I have chiral centers, so I have, I have two hands, so think of that as two chiral centers, but I have a plane of symmetry, so I'm a chiral. <coughs> if I took my mirror image, I would find that me and my mirror image are perfectly superimposable on one another. Okay? If I could 3D print my mirror image, you would find that. Okay? All right, so here's an example of bromochloromethane, right, which is what we just built here, kind of. We're just using different colors, right? You can see the plane of symmetry that runs right down through it, okay? So it has a plane of symmetry, and so it's not chiral. However, bromochlorofluoromethane is chiral. It's the example where we have four different colored spheres around that. There is no plane of symmetry. Okay, so it is a chiral. It is chiral. I have to be very careful when I say achiral. Am I saying achiral or a chiral? Right? So it is a chiral molecule. So chiral, achiral. Okay? You all are going to have to rely on your model kits. When you're doing your homework for this chapter, please use your model kits. Some of you are very good at three-dimensional drawing. If you're like me, you're not, and it just takes time and practice. But your model kit will help you get through it. So if we think about this alcohol, right? So this carbon atom, this is a chiral center. It has a hydrogen attached to it, a CH3, an ethyl group, and an alcohol. That's a chiral center. So if I put it up to a mirror point, I'm going to get a mirror image that's not superimposable. I have enantiomer A and enantiomer B, right? What does the solid wedge mean? Coming out of the plane of the, of the screen towards you. What does the dashed wedge mean? It's going behind the plane of the screen. And what is everything, where's everything else? It's in the plane of the screen, right? So when you build your models, you need to think about that plane, okay? It's not a mirror plane, it's just a plane of, of the screen, right? So that's how you would draw an antimer A and an antimer B, okay? It will be very easy for you to get this messed up. If you switch, any two groups here, guess what happens? You end up with the other enantiomer. Do that when you get home. Build one, build the other, and then just switch two groups, any two groups, and you'll find that you've built the other one. Switching any two groups on a chiral center will give you the other enantiomer. And guess what? When you're drawing without your model kit, it's really easy to do that, and you're just by accident. And then all of a sudden, I have to count something wrong. Okay? I've been doing this for over 30 years. I still build models. I just use a model kit that's actually a computer program that helps me build it. Okay? I don't play with my plastic models so much anymore. But 
Every now and then I'll get them out. Okay? It's very, very important. Okay? Notice we can also have chiral centers within a ring. So here's an example of a molecule. Don't worry about the name. It's called 1,2-epoxypropane. Where's the chiral center? Tell me when, when I get there. Right there. That is the chiral center. That carbon is attached to a hydrogen. It is attached to a CH3. It is attached to a CH2. And it is attached to an oxygen. There are four different things that are attached to that carbon, even though it's part of a ring. Okay? And so there are the different parts. We just talked about them, so I won't spend too much time. Okay? But those are the four different things that are attached to it. It's a chiral molecule. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a straight chain something. It can be part of a ring as well. Okay? So let me give you some more about why this is important. I just told you that molecules in your body are chiral, okay? And it turns out that medicines can also be chiral. This is thalidomide. Has anybody ever heard the thalidomide story? No? Well, you'll get kind of a semi-true story today. I don't remember all of it, okay? But decades ago, physicians used to prescribe thalidomide to expectant mothers because it is a good anti-nausea drug. Morning sickness is a problem, right? They wanted to be able to, to uh, provide some relief, okay? It turns out that thalidomide, this molecule, has a chiral center or stereogenic center. It's right here, okay? It's part of a ring. This carbon atom is attached to a nitrogen. It's attached to a hydrogen. It's attached to a carbonyl, and it's attached to a CH2. That's four different things, okay? This enantiomer, the left-handed version, if you will, for right now, treats nausea very, very well. The other enantiomer, the non-superposable mirror image, is a teratogen. You may know what that means. Serious and grotesque birth defects. Mothers who took this drug were giving birth to children that had part of their skulls missing, limbs missing, different things that are, are you know, unimaginably difficult to deal with, okay? Because this molecule interacts with the developing fetus differently than this one. And guess what the doctors were prescribing to them? A 50-50 mix. Half of what they were taking was poison. Just because one thing reflects differently than the other in space made all the difference in the world. So you might be thinking, well, why didn't they just make this drug then and give it to the expectant mother? It's reasonable, right? This was back in the 60s, 70s. We didn't know how to make one enantiomer of something very well yet. That's a relatively new development. Mother Nature, we used to think, was the queen of being able to do it. And she still is. But we're getting better. But it also turns out that our bodies have an enzyme, and I don't know the mechanism of this, that can take this one and interconvert it into the other one. So they don't prescribe thalidomide to anybody for this reason anymore. Okay? Taxol. Very potent anti-cancer agent. Was discovered from the bark of the yew tree. Okay? Every one of these stars that you see is a stereogenic center. Each one of them is a carbon atom that has a particular configuration. We would have had to completely wipe the yew tree off the face of the earth to treat a handful of cancer patients would have had to completely eliminate it from our bio, biosphere, okay? So we had to figure out how to make it synthetically in the lab. And each one of these chiral centers has to be exactly as drawn. Well, it only took us three decades to figure out how to do it. Because there's a lot of chiral centers that you gotta be aware of. 
Think about sugar. This is sucrose. This is table sugar. It's what you get from sugar cane. Look at all the chiral centers. Mother Nature can do it like that. Right? You plant a seed, water it, let a little sunshine, grows a stalk, squeeze the sugar out, voila. Pure sugar in the right stereochemistry. Change any one of those chiral centers to the other configuration, it's no longer sweet. Are you all starting to believe me that structure is important? Okay. It is very important. Right? Very important. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about this on Thursday. I want to get real quick, maybe we'll be able to get back to it real quick, but I want to finish off by a couple more examples. I should have moved these up. There are other drugs that you all are familiar with that have this type of property. Ibuprofen, Advil. When you all walk out of class with your headache and you take something like Advil, you're taking a chiral molecule, okay? S-ibuprofen is the active enantiomer of the molecule. S just means left-handed or right-handed. We're, we're, we're going to learn how to do that in just a minute, okay? But it turns out that the other enantiomer is harmless. So when you take the drug, you're actually taking a racemic mixture. So if you take 200 milligrams of ibuprofen, only 100 milligrams of that is actually do, curing your headache. The rest of it, you're just processing and excreting at some point during the day. Okay? If the other enantiomer causes no harm. Prozac, a very widely prescribed antidepressant, very powerful drug, does, does its job very well. It is an enantiomer. It's the opposite enantiomer, right? It's the R enantiomer. We'll talk again about that in a moment. But again, one chiral center. Now, I just told you Advil, they'll sell you as a racemic mixture. They have shown that the other enantiomer causes no harm. That is not the case for Aleve. Next time you go buy a bottle of, uh, buy a box of Aleve, read the back of it. It will say it is S-naproxen sodium. It's the sodium salt of naproxen. We're showing just the carboxylic acid here, okay? This is the anti-inflammatory agent. This is what cures your headache or your arthritis for your grandparents or whatever the case may be. The other enantiomer of naproxen is a potent liver toxin. You all depend on that chemist making that enantiomer and putting it in that pill so that you don't kill yourself. Liver toxins are very bad things. You can blow your liver up real quick and die pretty quickly. But you can go buy a leave over the counter. Why? Because we trust the chemist that somebody has made sure that all I'm getting is S-naproxen. Right? Very important. How many people ever watched Breaking Bad? Yeah? Okay, a few of you. It's getting a little long in the tooth. It ended in 2013, so it's been about 10 years ago. Uh, and you know that Walter White, who's shown there on the right, you know, he was the king of making methamphetamine. And you might be saying, why are you talking about illicit drugs? Okay? I'm going to tell you right now, and don't be odd, because I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the real story. I've taken methamphetamine. Never got high off of it, because I took the other enantiomer of methamphetamine. And many of you have as well. Okay? It turns out that the, this enantiomer is what gives you the high and all the bad effects. Okay? But the other enantiomer is in Vicks Vapo inhalers. So during your seasonal allergies where you want to have better, you know, being able to, to smell better, you go by that Vicks Vapo inhaler, you're inhaling methamphetamine a little bit. There's just a little bit in there. It opens up the airways. It's a good dilator. It opens it up so you can breathe better. Okay? What Walter White made was not only this enantiomer, it was a racemic mixture. So, when his drug dealer bought a kilogram of methamphetamine, only 500 grams of it was getting his customers high. The other 500 grams was giving them clear breathing passages. Okay. Okay. So, I know this is a bit of a, but it's a, it, but you know, people hear about meth, right? I mean, we hear about this kind of thing. 
But I want you to understand that just because you hear a name of something, there are good uses for a lot of these things. The other enantiomer, put it in your Vicks Vapo inhaler, open up my airways, let me breathe, I'm great. I'm not gonna get high off that. It matters. How that interacts with my body is different than how that interacts with my body. But they're connected exactly the same. They're just, that CH3 group, in this case, is coming out of the plane of the board towards me. Here it's going behind the plane of the board. That difference makes all the difference in the world. One I'll get arrested for, <laughs> one I'll go to bed sleeping very nicely at night, okay? But same number of carbon, same number of hydrogen, same number of nitrogens, connected the same, but just in three dimensions, a little bit different. All right, so what we are going to do starting on um, Thursday, thank you, is we're going to talk about how we label stereogenic centers, how we methodically do that. So we'll pick up with this on Thursday. We'll jump into the last piece of uh, chapter six on Thursday as well. So please look at the recording, look at the uh, slides, read the text before you come in, because this is, and bring your model kits, okay? Because you're going to have to figure out how to determine whether or not an enantiomer is R or S using some rules. So. Have a great rest of your day, and I will see you all later.